All right, I think we're settled in. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and introduce us. Welcome everyone. I'm Denise LeBlanc, Executive Director of Fuller Craft Museum in Brockton, Massachusetts. Our mission at Fuller Craft is to provide meaningful discovery of contemporary craft through exhibitions, collections, education, and public programs. We're committed to challenging perceptions and building appreciation of the natural world. Our purpose is to inspire, stimulate, and enrich an ever-expanding community. To learn more about the collection, exhibitions, other upcoming virtual programs, or becoming a member, please visit us at fullercraft.org. Thank you for joining our craft chat today with Sumal Muldoon, a multi-talented craftsperson and designer. We learned about Sue and her passion and skill for seat weaving from our friends and partners at North Bennett Street School in Boston, where Sue teaches. This led to a wonderful conversation with Sue on how she became interested in seat weaving and sharing stories of ancestry, craft, and of course, chairs. Now, as a little aside, uh, this topic appealed to me personally, uh, as in the midst of the global pandemic, while we were all home, uh, many of my old porch rockers on my 19th century farmhouse porch uh, were in need of a seat and I took up the task of reweaving them. Um, it was great fun and I learned a lot, but mostly what I learned is that it would have been really best to take one of Sue's classes. So I encourage <laughs> you all to do that. I hope you enjoy today's craft chat with Sue. Uh, let me introduce Sage Brousseau, our Director of Education to get this conversation started. Sage. Great, Denise, thank you so much. And thanks, Sue, for joining us today. Um, we are using the webinar format today. So we'll have uh, some time near the end of the program to take your questions. So feel free to use the Q&A button that's at the bottom of your screen to enter your questions um, at any point. And we'll try to get to them as best as we can towards the end. Um, and you can also use the chat function if you have a thing or two to contribute. Um, so welcome, Sue. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to learn a little bit more about you and your practice and um, what, what seat weaving is all about. So please tell us a little bit more about you and how you got started with this. Thank you. Seat weaving is a, is a pretty big story. Um, I started uh, about 30, 32 years. Sometimes I don't want to add it up. Uh, and I took an adult education course. My um, uh, my father was terminally ill, my children were young, and uh, after being a caretaker all the time, I decided I, it would be, be best for everybody if I went out and took an adult ed class, which I did. So, and I, and I took chair cane, which was a lot of fun. And uh, the, the instructor was one of my high school teachers, uh, Garland Reedy. I did find out that he may still be in Florida. I'm trying to locate him. I'll send him a video. He would get a kick out of it. Um, so I first started with chair caning, and then after I was done with that, I said, okay, what next? And I did rush. Okay, what next? And I did porch weave. Okay, what next? And, and he threw his hands up in the air and he said, I think you got it. So um, I started doing wicker. I had um, a business when the kids were younger for a while, and, uh, uh, but then I went back to, to work full time, and it went by the wayside. I was working 50, 60 hours a week in uh, retail and wholesale in the floral industry. And um, I would occasionally do a little bit, but you know, I was also doing other things like graphic design and uh, web design and uh, floral. Uh, I was a national sales manager for a wholesaler. And it took a lot of time. I didn't have a lot of time to came. And six years ago, actually right about now, right at the beginning, the, the first week in February, I broke my ankle and uh, severely, and I got stuck in the house for four months. So after I was done with my job, I uh, looked around and said, okay, what can I do now? Because I was relegated to the first floor with a cast. Um, so I started working on chairs that I had collected um, after a while. And I think I had about 16 down in the basement. and. I was really familiar with social media. So 
um, you know, I would just post what I was doing for the fun of it. And uh, I started getting a lot of requests. And I was like, hey, I need one done. I need one done. Hey, can you do mine? So uh, it, it took off a little bit slowly. And then uh, I got laid off from my regular day job, which was fine because it wasn't a good fit anymore. So I had a lot of time to work on doing um, just the chairs and the graphic design. I joined the Seat Weavers Guild and the very first meeting that I had, or the very first uh, email I had was about uh, a gathering that they had every year in Sturbridge, Mass. Um, I, and I know I saw Brandy, Brandy's on, hi Brandy. <laughs> and I met her there and uh, I met, uh, and, and Faith, I'm pretty sure Faith is here too. But I met, um, I hung out for a weekend in August with 60 seat weavers and we had a ball. And if we, we all became fast friends, we're still friends. Uh, we chat all the time. And, uh, and I learned a lot. One of the fun things was on that Sunday, they had a business clinic and I was a little gobsmacked because y'all do this for a living. <laughs> so I kind of took a second look at uh, what I was doing and I started focusing on doing the seat weaving. And then after a while I started focusing on teaching and I'm having a ball. Yeah, that's that awesome. Part? <laughs> It sounds like, you know, it's such a familiar story that something that kind of starts as a hobby becomes like your your passion and then becomes something that also becomes a bit of, um, you know, a vocation. I'm going to share my screen again and share a few um, images of your work. Um, so Loom Cane up on the top left is, um, it's sheet cane, press cane, it's got a few different names. Um, it goes in as one whole sheet instead of being uh, uh, woven uh, strand by strand um, in the holes. That's a uh, lace cane, which is our hand cane, which is down in the bottom right. Uh, the wicker chair on the top, wicker can be such a challenge because it's always different. Often it is uh, a, like being an investigator, a little bit of puzzle work. Um, I, it's hard to give somebody an estimate on wicker uh, when they just send me a picture because you actually have to physically look at it and see how brittle it is and, and uh, because sometimes it can break apart. Um, it's all a natural material. So and it does it does get brittle with age. Uh, the natural rush with the scissors on it, that is actually cattail. Those are cattails that are uh, dried and then rehydrated, uh, twist it, uh, have all the water wrung out with either a wringer or a butter knife and uh, twisted together. I don't get a lot of calls for that because uh, it's fairly expensive to do. And unless somebody wants a historically correct chair, they may not um, ask for that option. They may get a pre-twisted natural rush, which is similar, it looks similar. Um, but I've had people bring me uh, natural rush chairs from Virginia and um, New Hampshire. Um, the porch weave rockers up on the right hand side look familiar. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, it does. Yeah, they're fun. Uh, my favorite chair is a porch rocker. And mm -hmm. the reason I like porch rockers so much is because um, they only have one purpose, and that's to sit in and, and relax. Mm -hmm. Other chairs, you sit at the dining table or you sit at, in the bedroom or you sit uh, at work. But porch rockers, they're, they kind of have a sole purpose. Um, Danish cord is on the bottom. And that is a fiber product. And then the MCM mid-century modern um, weave is uh, the Wagner, the chair. Mm. And um, those, are, those are frequently around this area. I didn't get them for quite a while. Uh, most people down around New York or Boston, uh, seat weavers that I know, they would get them. <clears throat> um, the Irish straw, there's a before and after there. Those actually came from Ireland. There's hand cane and then fiber rush. Fiber rush is twisted uh, paper and it comes in a few different widths and a few different colors. So, and the paper rush after you do it, uh, you seal with shellac so it doesn't get stained. So why seat weaving? Why did, why did that call you? It's always different. It's, there's, there's really rarely two chairs alike. And after a while, I decided that I wasn't really repairing chairs, I was repairing memories. Mm -hmm. um, people would bring their chairs to me and uh, 
uh, some people would get pretty emotional when they picked them up. Um, I had one gentleman that uh, he was so quiet when he came in the house. He was in his 30s and uh, he just sat there and ran his hand over the chair, feeling it. And I, I just let him be for a few minutes. I said, I'm like, are you okay? <laughs> and he really was teary eyed. Uh, you know, he, he said, I wish my mother and my grandmother were here to see this because I used to sit on the porch and read the comics up in Maine. And I used to sit here and run my fingers over the chair. He says, and, and it was broken for so long. He says, and now I can do it again. So, and, and there, there is a different range of people that, that bring me their chairs. Um, a couple of days ago, I had somebody uh, pick up a chair, uh, a wicker chair that I repaired and uh, she had found it on the side of the room and paid a fair amount of money to get it done. And then I had another customer bring her grandfather's chair and it really, it was probably a couple hundred dollars to fix it. Um, but she said, no, 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 it's not worth it. So, you know, there's a, there's a really broad range. So do you uh, feel there, there's more interest now um, in upcycling and mending um, from a sustainability standpoint? Do you feel that uh, you've seen more of that lately? I, ha I have. Um, people aren't really quick to throw things away. Um, and uh, uh, I have fun with some upcycled stuff that's a little bit different. That's on another, uh, on another slide. And um, I'll work with upcycled materials like uh, men's ties and leather belts and paracord and anything I can get my hands on, I'll leave with it. Let's um, share some more of those um, images too. And then um, I also included some before and afters um, to kind of talk about that sort of um, story in the chair. Um, Cause I, in talking to you previously, I, I really felt that was um, a strong part of sort of what you're all about is really, it's not just mending a chair, it's sort of like refurbishing memories and, and things as well. But so you also do um, other uh, woven forms too, it seems. Well, the basket started because I had extra material left over and it was short and I didn't want to throw it away. So, and I am a repurposer and upcycler. Um, my mom was a quilter. Um, every button was saved, all fabric was saved, you know, she taught me how to refinish furniture. Mm, okay. Sorry, a little emotional. I miss her. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I started making baskets and I had a ball. Um, it, it, it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, backpacks, there's a couple of backpacks there. Backpacks are some of my favorites. Um, and a lot of people are using them uh, more in an urban setting now. And uh, instead of a briefcase, uh, they're uh, using them at the farmers markets. Um, I'm, I was heavily involved with farmers markets for about 10 years. I've kind of weaned myself off of that, mostly because I spend so much time with the chairs. I felt like I wasn't paying enough attention to the markets. But um, yeah, it's a you know market baskets uh, and purses, things like that. Oh, and stones. <laughs> those were fun. Beautiful. I did those in Italy. I was in Italy last year for a month. And um, I'm not one to sit still and I couldn't do any chairs. I brought web design work with me um, to work with when I was over there. Um, but we would go walking on the beach in Pizzo and uh, I found all these beautiful rocks. I would you know, go home with my, my pockets laden with rocks and driftwood. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty crazy. I even brought quite a few of them home on the plane. My, my uh, backpack was pretty heavy. <laughs> so, um, but I had made a lot of friends uh, through Facebook uh, that were seat leaders, leaders in Italy. So I contacted them and they let me know how to order material over there. So um, I would sit at night and, you know, listen to music or watch a show and leave stones. So, and then the baskets, I did the baskets, all that driftwood came off of uh, the, off the beach and the pizza. So, yeah, and these are some of the fun things. Uh, the um, yellow chair resides in Asheville with Brandy's niece. Um, the, there, and I do a lot with the leather belts. Um, they, they thought I was a little crazy at the thrift store. I would go in uh, every senior day and you know buy 40 or 50 leather belts. <laughs> After about four times, she said, I'm, I'm not sure I wanna know, but what are you doing with them? <laughs> I was like, recycling, really, really, upside 
was like, look, I'm making chairs. <laughs> so, um, and there's one with denim. Uh, the blue porch rocker is done with um, an upcycled, I bought a, a pickle barrel full of uh, nylon nautical line. So um, the paracord is done. It, I got that at Home Depot and that's a chair I did with my grandson. When you were talking about history and family, um, those stools in the middle were done with ties. And uh, I was lucky enough to be featured on a show, local TV show. By the time the show was over, um, this woman was ringing my phone and um, she wanted 10 stools done for her children and grandchildren. And she brought me 10 bags and everybody, every bag had somebody's name on it. Teddy had all the teddy bear ties and uh, you know, there was a different theme. So I made 10 stools and it was a Christmas gift for her children and grandchildren. And uh, she didn't call me for a while after the holiday. And, you know, I was hoping everything went okay. But then, and I, I knew that her um, husband had been in a nursing home. Um, so she uh, called me and said that everybody loved them, especially because he passed away on Christmas Eve. And Christmas morning, um, they got up and everybody had a special gift from dad and grandpa. grandpa. Yeah. The, uh, the blue chair is corded wool. And uh, I do a lot at sheep and wool festivals. And uh, I thought that would appeal to them. And the one on the right is done with leather strips. Um, I couldn't really find a source for the leather strips. So I had to buy half a hide and cut it in the strips myself. So it was fun, you know. I like the challenge. Everything that I, I, you know, everything's different. That's what I like about it. Yeah, it's just it's really amazing. You have no, you know, there's no shortage of ideas or creativity for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna start some of the before and after images. So I think like there's just, I mean, I'm curious to know like how long the process takes and. Um, is it a simple, I mean, it's, I feel like it's complicated, but maybe it's, it's less complicated than it seems. It, it can be complicated. Um, it, it, it can be tedious. It depends on what it is that you're doing, but it can also be meditative. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the chairs on the screen right now, that's hand paint chairs, and those are done hole by hole. Um, I've got a little sample I'm working on here for, um, I've got a design, this is a star David, and you have to weave every single piece. So it does take a long time, it depends on the chair. This is a stool that's almost done. So you're weaving one, two, three, four, five, six different ways, and then putting a binder on it. So there's seven steps to doing a hand paint chair. So it, it does take a while. There are a lot of different patterns. Um, and uh, I don't do a lot of the different patterns. I don't get a call for them. And, but the fancier patterns, uh, something like this is better for the back of a chair. It's not that good for, um, for the seat of a chair because it's not as strong. So um, yeah, it can take eight, to 12 hours on average to hand paint a chair. Um, I just did a rocker that had that was pretty big with hand paint that had the seat in the back and it was probably 22 hours. So, but I'm doing it on my time frame. I can sit and watch a movie in cane. I can mm -hmm. watch my grandkids in cane. I can, I, I spend a lot of time in a boat in New London in the summer and uh, if I go down the weekend, there is always a chair in the back of my car. So <laughs> I, I have a very flexible um, way to work, which is fun. There's something about chairs. Like I have, a, I love chairs too, and I don't even know what it is. And I definitely have a relative that had a like a barn full of chairs um, that they they were going to someday, you know, recane, refinish, but never really got around to. What do you think it is about chairs in particular? You know, nobody wants to throw them away. <laughs> you know, I, I think they carry stories. Yeah. You know, I, I think they carry memories. Yeah. Um, and I always imagine who sat in them and, and who, how they were used. And um, the, the, the chair, that chair, I, I got 30 years ago. 
that that, I, that was one of the chairs I got when I first started. And uh, I probably bought it for $5 and I can't even explain how many hours it took to strip that by hand, um, yeah. but I did. I, I still have it, you know? My grandkids love all the chairs in my house. You know, they help out. Yeah, so. it's like a Goldilocks, right? Yeah. This one, <laughs> just right. Yeah, Dude. that's my grandson's chair. And I picked that up at a, um, at a tag sale, I think for 10 or $15 and script it. And uh, he's 10 now. I don't think he can fit into it, but his little brother does and loves it and sits in it every time he comes over. And, uh, and I have a brand new uh, grandson that's just a month old. So I'm sure he'll be the next in it. So I have my mother's rocker from when she was a child. So, you know, there's, there's a continuity with cheer. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share for a moment, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, your practice as an, as an educator and a little bit more, if you could share with us a little bit more about like, um, what, what does, you know, besides having an old chair, what else do we really need to um, get started if I was interested in, in, in chair weaving, seat weaving? Denise, what did you, how did you enter this endeavor? Well, I, I, I took the adult ed class, so yeah. I, brought, I brought a chair with me. Um, <laughs> I, I, mm -hmm. I have a couple of different formats for classes, and of course this year I really had to change it up. Um, mm -hmm. I've done a lot with um, sheep and wool festivals, and at North Bennett, um, we uh, worked with stools because they were smaller and a little bit quicker to do. So this is a rush stool that we've been doing in a lot of the classes. Now this is a two to two and a half hour project. Um, and we did it online in North Bennett. And it, I loved it. We, I, had, I was a little nervous at first, you know, because this is a new format for everybody. And sometimes it's hard to teach somebody when you're looking over their shoulder. There's a lot of pulling. You have to make sure the tension is right. You know, so I was a little concerned that there was a challenge in a physical class. How was it gonna be online? All I could see was the top of people's heads and rush flying in the air. <laughs> but at the end, they all held up their stools. And I would say, you know, 90% of them were, were, were nice and tight. You know, a couple had a couple little loose things, but that, you know, but they, they, they corrected it. Um, they, we did uh, port trackers. So, I mean, I think if somebody's interested in learning how to weave, these classes are a good start um, because if you're not comfortable with it, you haven't spent too much time or too much money. Um, but if you want a bigger project, you can move on to a bigger project. I'm doing a three-day uh, course at Snow Farm in August. Oh, and we're doing great. Work rockers. Sue, did your interest um, in seat weaving stem from any textile weaving practices or? Oh, I, I started. I started crafting things. I think the first uh, craft fair I did was when I was 12 years old. I <laughs> sold I sold big paper um, sunflowers made out of folded tissue paper. I was just thinking about that the other day. <laughs> I, I've worked with flowers. I, I worked two dimensional and three dimensional. Mm -hmm. um, I sew, I craft. Back in the day, I macrame. The other um, adult ed class I took was wood carving. The first thing I did was to uh, uh, fix a piece of furniture and carve a piece that had been broken on a library table. And uh, my instructor said, okay, what do you want to do next? I'm like, well, I want to do a carousel horse. Wow. I, have a, I have a tablecloth-sized <laughs> carousel horse. It took me nine months. Wow. But I did it. And then I have a carousel rabbit and a carousel bear. So, I think what's so inspiring about your story is that um, nothing stops you, you know, you really, you have an interest and you figure out how to do it and, and how to pursue it. I, I so admire that. I think that's uh, fabulous. Also, I know when we spoke earlier, we talked a lot about sort of ancestry and how the, these traits sometimes are passed along in families and you spoke a little on that. And I'm wondering if you could touch on that. Yeah, well, my mom uh, taught me how to sew probably starting around seven or eight years old. Um, I, I sewed a lot at home. I was in 4-H. Um, I quilted. Uh, I, I, I did a lot of different things. I'm applying for my uh, dual citizenship in Ireland. 
And so it was a really nice surprise. Uh, my, my grandfather and my grandmother met at the um, cheese mills in Manchester, Connecticut. They both worked at the silk mills. And, um, but what I didn't know, they, they came from Ireland. They came from Armagh. Um, the Cheney brothers recruited 800 families to come and work in the mills. Um, so when I started doing my research about my, um, my family for my uh, citizenship, I found out that my great grandfather uh, was a weaver and he had, a, it was a cottage industry. So he had a separate building in the back of the house where he wove linen on a loom. Everybody asked why I don't have a loom yet. And I did, well, mostly it's because I don't have room because there's too many chairs. That's next, Sue. Yeah. That's the next project. <laughs> it is next. Well, they, this, this beautiful piece came from Italy and uh, uh, there's a, a wonderful museum and school that, uh, that I visited there and became friends with them there. And uh, so I may sit at their looms for a little while if I go next time. So speaking of weaving, you mentioned sort of that you you stick to a couple of different patterns, but do you use more traditional patterns or or what kinds of patterns are you drawn to and why? I like the traditional um, mostly because, you know, you're restoring a chair back to its original form, but I, but I will change stuff up. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'll do that like with, with a lot of the um, dyed reeds and the, and the alternative mm -hmm. materials. That, that's my playtime. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's out, of, out of the box. So it's, it's a little bit different. So. Yeah, I love, I love that you, you kind of, um, you know, travel the spectrum from traditional to really creative and contemporary. I'm actually going to pull up um, some of the, oh, I want to, we have some images of you um, in your groove teaching. So I'm going to pull those up for a minute, but then I have a couple of um, questions about some of the other work we showed. So this is in action. Yep, that's a, that's a porch weave class. That's a stool. And, you know, talk about teaching a little bit. What, you know, the thing I love about crafters especially is that we're, we seem to be a community that is about community, about sharing um, our knowledge and our experience. Um, can you speak to that a little bit about why you got into teaching? Yeah, well, I got into teaching because people were asking for help and, and I was like, well, let me, let me show you how to do that. Um, and I also, when I went to the uh, Seat Weaver Guild's meetings, um, everybody would say it's a dying art. And, and mm -hmm. you know, my, my friends and I all know, no, it's not a dying art. It's, it's, it's thriving. Um, there are more and more weavers all the time. And I think that does have to do a lot with the upcycling and repurposing. I got so much help from people at the Seat Weavers Guild that I wanted to pass it along. And then I found out that there were opportunities to start teaching. And I started with two classes one year. It was about three or four years ago. And last year, I probably had about 125 <laughs> students um, all told between all the classes. And that was great. You know, they're friendly people. We have great conversations. We have a blast when we're in class. We even have, we have a good time when we're online. So, you know, it's, um, and I like, I like seeing people learn things. It's really, it's, it's definitely like a transformative um, thing as like a, as a creative person, like sh sharing it with someone else, I feel like is, is as much a learning experience for you as it is for the, for the students that you're with. It's pretty amazing. I mean, I, I've learned, I, I don't know how to say it, but I've learned kind of backwards on a few things mm -hmm. um, because everybody learns in a different fashion. They learn visually, audibly, tactily. And um, some people are really good at reading instructions. Some people aren't. So, you know, I had to learn how to cover all the bases. Um, I'm lucky in that because I, I do the photography and graphic design that I can make all my own instructions and do mm -hmm. them in a way that's pretty clear so people understand. So when I do an online or a live class, they all get PDF instructions to bring home with them. So the, the basket on the left side with the wool, can you tell yeah. us a little bit about that? That's corded wool. And I, I, I did that intentionally when I did a, a fiber festival. And um, so I, I, I mean, I start that basket. Uh, I didn't dye all those colors on purpose to make that basket. 
that was a mishmash basket. That was what I had on hand and what I thought would go nicely together. But since I was going to the uh, Sheep and Wool Festival, um, I thought it would be nice to, in, to put some of the wool in top. I'm not totally familiar with corded wool. What is, how is that, that? Let me grab some. This is corded wool. This is a mixture of alpaca and merino. Normally you wouldn't be able to use yarn like this, but this it has a cord on the inside. Let's see if I can pull some off. So this is strong enough um, to, to weave with. And this is a fun project because it's got a little bit of dust on it. <laughs> this is a fun project, um, especially for kids or people that don't have a lot of mobility with their hands because you don't have to pull it tight, tight and it nestles into each other. Um, with the fiber brush, you have to pull like a bear. You know, I can only do two rush chairs in a row and then I have to switch and work on something else. You know, I have to take care of my hands. So, so this, is, this is a fun uh, product to use with kids. I taught a class at a fiber festival in uh, Maine and one woman bought a, uh, four kits. She wanted to make one for every cat. So her cats all have <laughs> that's great hey it made her happy <laughs> yeah you know? so but the, the material is a little bit more expensive um but it's an awful lot of fun most people would call this rug wool um what about um some of the other materials do you do you collect do you gather natural materials and what about like invasive plants have you used anything like that uh, I have a big pile of grapevine in the backyard that I haven't done anything with, but that would uh, lend itself more to, ba to baskets um, and not as much chairs. Um, right. With the, um, the, uh, the baskets that I showed you with the driftwood handles, I did those when I uh, spent some time in Italy. It was pretty fascinating when we went hiking in the mountains. I, as a florist, I was really thrilled to find uh, eucalyptus growing wild. Oh, wow. So I brought back armfuls of eucalyptus and then I had reed and I thought, well, why not try my hand at natural dye? And I boiled a big vat of uh, reed with eucalyptus. And the funny thing is, if, if you look at the, um, look at the pictures, all that reed was the same, was in the same pot and it all came out different colors out of the same pot, which was pretty fascinating. And then I used, um, driftwood or pussy willows uh, to make the handle. So yeah, I, I was out foraging all the time over there. <laughs> Rocks, driftwood, you know, eucalyptus, it was fun. Yeah, that kind of becomes the story of the basket or the chair too, you know, where it you did those things. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, other tools that are needed for seat weaving, is, it, is there a lot of tools involved? It seems like it's, it's pretty low on the yeah, it's it's not much. Let's see what I have back here. I have, well, I don't think I have a whole lot stuck in back here. Um, this is one of my favorite tools, a butter <laughs> knife. And I, I know that I know that sounds silly, but in in my list of materials, I I always tell everybody to bring a butter knife, um, because if I'm having a hard time getting this in here, I'll just use a butter knife to squeeze it through. You can buy basket um, basket tools, but I'm pretty stuck on the butter knife. There's um, tons in my uh, toolbox and hardly any in my kitchen. <laughs> um, pegs, uh, I don't have any pegs handy right now, but pegs for hand caning, um, clippers, and um, an awl, which is, or you know, you could use an ice pick, which is something sharp and you use that uh, to clear out the holes. After you get quite a bit of material in the holes, some of it gets really tight. So I'll put um, a pick in there and wiggle it around and I'll make some room. So, in water, a lot, a lot of the, the rush, the cane, um, anything done with a reed should all be done um, when it's wet. Um, clamps come in handy. Um, if, I use a lot of these little clamps. Like if I was going to do, you know, save save something in place, I would just I would use a clamp. Um, I'll do that with a rush. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not incredibly expensive 
um, to get a lot of the tools. Some of the materials can be a little expensive. Um, I just ordered some rawhide to do a snowshoe chair. Um, hickory bark is a little more expensive. I haven't worked with it, but I know a lot of weavers that do. So um, I ash, um, I use mostly reed, um, but I have worked with ash that I got from a gentleman in Canada and he harvests his own trees and uh, uh, cuts them up and hammers them and uh, splits them into uh, strips to use for weaving. Denise, do you have any other questions you wanted to sneak in before we're, we're close to the time? We're yeah, to I, I want to know what's next, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> what is your next project? Well, I just I just started to do uh, to promote my a couple of my own classes here um, in the, in this studio. This was uh, if you look at my blog, uh, the latest blog I put out, um, you can see some of the before and afters in this studio. Um, and because of COVID, I was pretty much encouraged to, um, it, it was necessity. I had to have some place to film, to do, um, to do things like this. And uh, so I'm starting to teach a couple of my own classes and uh, they'll be virtual. This is one of the Reed Hearts. Oh, wonderful. This is the first one that's gonna come yeah. up in a couple of weeks. And then uh, the backpack. You know, almost get it. So, you know, this, I'll, I'll be teaching people how to do the backpacks. Um, and I'm going to start doing a few small classes in here. I don't want to go overboard. Um, yeah, so I think I'm going to do a little bit more of, of, of my own teaching, maybe even in remote places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it just occurred to me that when I go to Italy, I can do a virtual class from there. Do you teach children, uh, children's classes as well? I do, I do. It's I, I haven't taught a lot. I, I practice on my grandkids. The the children's classes for weaving, I think I would do with the corded wool. Or I would do place maps with weed and, and use some really nice colors and things like that. So sure. uh, I mean when my grandkids come over the house, it isn't, you know, what are we gonna do? It's what are we gonna make? Mm, so I love that. <laughs> you know, if it's yeah. something artistic or it's it's usually blueberry muffins. <laughs> <laughs> also a craft <laughs> yeah. Yes. yeah well a lot, a lot of people have figured out if you go on my instagram i uh I, i've been baking a lot i, I went down the, the uh sourdough rabbit hole during covid mm, as did i yeah. yeah and it is a rabbit hole i yes. must say yeah i had the best sourdough pizza last night oh my god <laughs> <laughs> it was really good so and i and i was thinking about it you know this is one of those middle of the night things you know three o'clock in the morning you get the faxes from the universe um mm -hmm. is that i think a, a side of a, a side benefit to doing all the dough i think it helps my hands mm -hmm. i work with my hands so much to sit there and knead sure. dough and have it be so nice and warm and and flex different muscles you know so i'll just tell everybody it's for work <laughs> I think my, my, I, I did a private lesson for an occupational therapist last week and I bet he would agree with me. Quickly, so can you tell us a little bit more about the Seat Weavers Guild um, and if people are interested in, in that, how they might be um, able to join? How, how does the Seat Weavers Guild gather and do things? Well, the Seat Weavers Guild, um, they, they were supposed to have their 13th annual gathering last year in, in Hull, Massachusetts. And uh, mm -hmm that got uh, put by the wayside. Um, we're, we're still not sure if we're gonna have it this year uh, in Hull, we're working on it now. Um, but it's a group that's been around for 14 years. This will be the 14th year. And uh, it's people from all over the country. So, and it's amazing how things differ from one part of the country to the other. Um, but then once a year, they have a gathering and get together and spend Friday night, all day Saturday, and half a day on Sunday, um, just networking and having fun and, and learning from each other. We have tips and tools on, on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I mean, Sunday afternoon. On, on Saturday, um, we, all day, we have not per se classes, but we have workstations and or else um, small demonstrations so people can share their knowledge and ask a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. So we have a private Facebook group where that's a nice um, safe place to ask candid questions 
um, especially about business, because you're not out there with the general public and saying, hey, I, I have this problem with a customer or, or I'm not sure what I should be charging for this. Um, so um, people are really friendly about sharing their life experiences as a weaver um, or as a new weaver, they have a lot of questions. So this year, because uh, we couldn't have a gathering, we decided to waive um, on the members' fees and just continue them because that's that's what uh, the dues goes towards mostly is is doing that one big gathering every year. Mm -hmm. But on top of that, they extended an open invitation to anybody that wanted to join the Seat Weavers Guild um, until uh, the end of June this year for free. So if you want to join as a single member, it's usually thirty thirty five dollars and um, uh, so on the application, you sign up and then we give you credit and no money changes hands and you get to join the guild for the duration of this year. And we'll see what happens next year. So, but right now uh, we're at 180 people and uh, I was just looking back at some records and uh, Rhonda from membership uh, shared that um, at, since August, we have 25 new members, and I'm, I'm pretty sure quite a few people from the North Bennett Street School um, online classes are, are new members. So yeah, there, there was a spurt after that happened. Yeah, well, that speaks to Sage's comment on craft as community, right? Yeah. 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 For sure. So I, I did enter um, your website into the chat for anybody who was interested in learning a little bit more about you or maybe getting in touch with you about weaving or repairs. Um, but I do want to, um, sadly, ha we have to end this um, great conversation for, for now. Um, I wanted to thank you again for joining us, Sue. Uh, any, any other parting words you want to leave us with before we sign off? Whatever you do, just weave. Just make <laughs> just get it out of your system. If it's love wrong, it. who cares? Just try. Just you try. Know, pick, I love some, it. pick something up and, and start making something with it, you know, and, and, and you can't go wrong. And and I really do think that, that kids should be encouraged to do things with their hands and get them away from their screens a little bit more, especially now when they spend so much time online for online learning for school. Absolutely. Yeah. So and I'm just going to thank, thank everyone. Thank you, Sue. And thank everyone for joining us today, for watching and for offering your questions. Um, it's been a really great experience. And, and if you enjoyed this program today, please consider uh, contributing to Fuller Craft by making a donation. I'm going to type in our website address um, and learn more about Fuller Craft by visiting our website, fullercraft.org. Um, membership information, donation information, and more. We have lots of more virtual programming, including classes and workshops coming up. So check in with us at fullercraft.org and we'll see you next month for another craft chat. Thanks everyone. Hi all, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Sue. Thank you.